Halloween right around the corner, it's time to talk about a scary game. This video is slightly haunted. I thought I already did a review of Fear, but it's come back to haunt me. The same plot and ideas, they've all come back as a spooky shambling corpse. Things might get hairy, so sit back and turn out the lights and... Or not. In Fear 2, you play a Delta Force operative named Michael Beckett. The game kicks off before the ending of Fear 1, and you've been sent in with your team to arrest the corporate director of Armacam. Things don't go to plan, and now you need to fight an army of clones and stop a spooky woman. Look, I know the box is Fear 2, but this is a, a like a soft reboot of Fear 1. I'll talk about the story differences a little later, but for now that's all you need to know. Alrighty, let's look at the presentation. For a game from 2009, it looks like a game from 2009. I'd even say it's closer to the high end of the scale. The textures are solid, and on occasion the lighting and shadow effects can be pretty impressive. The detail in the models and the animation is also great, and a step up from Fear 1. There are more improvements, like better soft shadows, more detail in the environments, and eventually, more varied environments. It's a good start, but things change more when you get into the lighting. It is odd that the first game used it so well, and Fear 2 has so many problems with it. The game tries very hard to convince you that there are no problems and things are just like they were before. But you've changed, and I can tell. The lighting is far less dynamic than Fear 1. To explain, this game had very harsh lighting. There weren't a ton of fake light sources in Fear 1, and it wasn't uncommon at all to be in a room that was nearly pitch black. Some textures had lights mapped onto them and other common techniques to make you not realize it wasn't all dynamic. But there was enough that was to really sell the illusion. When you consider that and the AI, Fear 1 is kind of like the greatest magic show in video games. It did come at a cost where the environments were barren and similar to make the effect work properly. What they were doing already was nearly setting computers on fire, so they couldn't push it that far. Fear 2 seemed to have an opposite ratio where I was actually shocked when I saw my own shadow compared to just being a commonplace thing. Okay, so the lighting is just worse, but how is that an actual problem? As I said before, there was a lot of attention to detail in Fear 1 when it came to lights and levels. The lack of detail in the environments also makes it easier to pick out an enemy. If you really had trouble, you could use your handy dandy flashlight and reveal yourself more. That's still the uncommon solution. So now we don't have nearly as many of these lights and the environment has way more stuff in it. So what's the solution? Well, it might make your head spin, but they settled on cover everyone in light brights. In fact, if you go in slow-mo, every enemy will be highlighted in bright orange. There's a lot wrong about slow-mo now too, but I'll hold off. Just having people with light brights is already silly, so they compensated by also giving the game a more sci-fi aesthetic. Your weapons can glow, environments can glow, everything must glow. This hurts the design. The Heavy in Fear 1 has dangerous glowing blue insect eyes. It makes him unique and he stands out in darkness. The Heavy stands out here too, but he glows like the damn sun. This could look really awesome in darkness, in fact there's a section of the DLC where it looks incredible. And it looks incredible because it's a very small section that was carefully planned out. But now look at this doofus in broad daylight. The giant orb of light around him isn't behaving realistically, but even worse than that is the fact that he looks silly. You can barely tell what he's supposed to look like, and also his AI is breaking this clip. There are some enemy designs I really like, and for the most part the glow on them is minimal. Making a design but saying it has to glow here, here, and here is a horrible parameter to work with. This also greatly changes the tone. In Fear 1, the replicas rolled around in armored cars, and I like that. They were this insane sci-fi element, but being carried around in something fairly mundane. It grounds them and helps you suspend disbelief. The same thing went for the sci-fi weapons. They weren't covered in gizmos, they just looked like an experimental weapon. The grounding made fantastical elements stand out, but they never pushed it too far. But now we're in light bright punk, so we have to rearrange all of that to make it consistent. What was once grounded is now cartoony. And anime. Also, this is supposed to be a horror game. Ghosts and spirits have not been spared and suffer from the same issues. They have to be visible, make them bright. It's a shame because they're well animated, but they're a miasma of bloom and light, so you can't really be afraid of them. You also see them better if they get stuck on a rat, and that's... that's pretty embarrassing. The cloaking enemies bend light and color around them when shot, which is actually a really cool effect. But it's made less special because 1. So many enemies already emit light, and 2. That effect wasn't enough and they also have to shoot arcs of lightning everywhere. Even the horror sequences aren't spared. Let's make a comparison. I'll use a similar scene. Here's one. Now two. So what's wrong about it? 
This has potential to be the stronger scare. It's all in first person and uncut and right in front of you. And then someone presses every post-process button at once. I can barely tell what's happening and not in a good way. Maybe as a one-off it could be okay, but this is the game's favorite technique for scaring you. There's not much build-up to these either, they just happen. This is like watching the grudge during a solar flare. Maybe these images are effective, but I can't see them. It's honestly incredible just how mishandled the lighting in this game is on nearly every level. When ghosts come out in Fear 1, they rip reality around them. They're supernatural, but coming into a world you know, and that's what makes them scary. And I know horror is a subjective thing, but I'm willing to bet less people are scared by the sunny delight dimension. And there is a legitimately great sequence in this game, but I'll save that. At the end of the day, this might not matter to you. You might enjoy the more detailed environments and colors that Fear 2 has. My problem is how easily it can look like so many other games of its era. There are a lot of technical improvements over the predecessor. In retrospect though, Fear 1 has a brutal industrial art style. You typically only saw bright red painting someone to the wall or seeing Alma's dress. Blood is red, dress red, caveman brain no Alma bad news. We can't do that now. Now she grabs you and the lights are flashing and you mash a button. So to wrap it up, the light in Fear 2 is an absolute mess. You can't put all the blame on consoles for this one, this is an art direction problem too. Now the heads up display, that falls under sort of. You know, the centered elements are so it fits in a TV. But the horrible blue lines, no. You're wearing Call of Duty Elite Gamer goggles. It's supposed to be an immersive HUD element like Republic Commando or Metroid Prime. In practice, you might just get some water droplets on your face and the screen cracks when you die. The rest of the time, they do nothing for the screen and are just annoying. It's worth noting that in the DLC for this game, this was also removed. I think they realized it was an unfinished idea. But my big UI annoyance is the ammo icons. For some reason, different ammo types will sometimes share the same icon. This only serves to add some needless confusion to managing your ammo. I have shells, now I don't. A slightly different symbol could have helped here. I'm not completely done with the visuals, but let's take a break and look at the sound. No wait, I meant listen. The Fear 1 composer is back, but the music has become more generic. There are still a few standout tracks, but it feels a lot more subdued than before. The music did become stronger and frankly noticeable in the later parts of the game. Sadly, it never reaches previous heights. The weapon sounds also don't hold up, and beyond that, they don't even measure up to an average scale. They sound weak and lack bass. It's like we've gone backwards. The only exception is the sniper rifle. Got it. The sound design in general is very average, but the voice acting is good. It's just the, um, it's just the writing. You're like free pizza at an anime convention. The weaker sound is one of a few factors that makes the combat less satisfying. This game suffers from a lot of ideas that look good on paper, but in execution fall flat. I realize I've been horrifically negative, so let's look at a few positives. Some new additions over the first game. You can now hold four weapons instead of three. Great change. Vaulting over cover is also welcome. You can properly sprint now. It's actually a fairly pathetic sprint, but it does feel more like running than Fear 1. The forever flashlight. I don't see why not. There's now a grenade cooking meter. Another welcome addition. Aim down sights. At first, this may seem like a pure positive change, but it came in a sacrifice. Aiming is a lot easier in general, but we've lost a lot of spectacle. What do I mean by that? Well, besides lighting, Fear 1 also ruled at making particle effects. Smoke and debris from a gunfight would hang in the air long after the fight was over. All the weapon decals in the walls were just icing on the cake. 
In slow-mo, all this stuff reaches a completely new level. You can fire your gun and walk through your own warping bullet trails. You can aim, which just zooms in a bit, but you are completely fine just hip-firing. These effects are worse than Fear 2, but they are still here. Like I said before, the lighting's an issue. Slow-mo makes your enemies glow, and they're shooting out strawberry jelly. For now, let's pretend Fear 2 looks the same. Alright, here comes the big money shot. And there's the problem. Your weapons are far more inaccurate when hip-firing, so you need to aim down your sights. The scope helps you aim, but it's hiding the true level of devastation you're causing. Your vision is restricted to the Jelly Man. Look how much more you can see when aiming in Fear 1. You have the big picture of everything you're doing. You see how your weapons move, you see how other enemies are reacting to it. With the exception of a scoped rifle, you can see it all clearly. Monolith wanted to see you turn people into skeletons. Fear 2 now looks and plays like a modern FPS game. The scope fills your screen, the muzzle flare is huge, and the blue lines are still there. The gunplay is competent, but now it looks and plays like any other military shooter of this time. Okay, other new things. You can flip cover over. Kind of. This is one of those looks good on paper ideas. It takes too long to do and it's never placed somewhere truly effective. You mostly die doing it. This ties into the level design. The first half of this game especially has some poor decisions, so let me go over those. The first issue is how much of the arenas are generally unused. This is due to the enemy AI and how they spawn. There could be a technical effect for the term, I'm just gonna call it clown car fighting. Enemies love pouring into a level from one spot in a big group. They don't seem to utilize cover as much and instead really enjoy charging the player. It leads to a lot of the fighting feeling more like spawn camping. Here's an example. Early in the game, there's a big arena. There's a lot of cover and elevation for different distance fights. This is a huge room, there's gonna be some kind of war in here. Now the fight is triggered by pushing a button and you need to turn three valves to escape. The valves are spread far apart, so you think you'll use the whole level for this. Nope. The soldiers actually spawn in different areas, but their AI compels them to run towards you, and so they all get in close range. This war effectively took place in a corner of it. Then power armor comes up in elevator like Fear 1, but it's the same thing because it's just a single enemy. Also, when it dies, it makes like that joke bass boost sound now. So the fight is over, but guess what? I only turned one valve. These valves could have triggered new enemies to spawn at different points, but instead, it's just busy work after the fight. The boss doesn't come up in the last valve, it just comes up. The whole level is set up great for an interesting fight, but the mechanics just didn't allow it. Beyond that, the first half of the game is just horribly linear. There's barely any room to maneuver or flank or do anything interesting. It is kind of funny that the first decent arena in the game is, in the story, an actual fighting arena. They just keep you in these closed, short spaces for so long. AI runs out to try and flip cover in the hallway and just dies. It doesn't help so many objectives feel like padding. You could say the Valve Arena was poorly thought out, but at least something happened. This was also an issue the previous game could have, just not nearly this frequently. And the levels do get better in the later half of the game. The standout fight is right before the end on these reconfiguring trams, so enemy spawns are moving all over the place and distances are changing. It's a legitimately great fight. Levels before this also show improvement, where the cover objects can actually be used properly as cover, and the AI in general is just acting better. Yet, they're still very fond of charging you. Whereas before you could have actual standoffs where no one's shooting and just waiting, that's not the case anymore. The AI seems dumber this time around. I don't know if it's the level design or the cover objects messing them up. Maybe they did have to tone it down for consoles. Whatever the reason, there were several times where the enemy just forgot I was there at all. This wasn't a one-off thing, this was something that happened several times during the game. If an enemy makes a bad tactical choice, you can chalk it up to going, oh, well, they made a bad choice. Here, it's more like they're just breaking down. Who knows, it could be more advanced, but I perceive them as being much dumber. Even the really scripted events get messy. Here, I was curious to see how things would play out, so I just let the event happen. Sounds like it's over. Check it out. All right. Together, huh? There are still flashes of greatness here and there. The AI could still surprise me from time to time with what it was capable of. I was really impressed when someone leaned over a ladder to shoot me. It could be that they ramp it up in the late game to contrast the early game, but I didn't see that. Still, this game is short. You can beat it in less than five hours. This brings me to the difficulty. The jump from normal to hard is like an NBA frog jump. The enemies can completely dump damage on you now. You can frequently be one shot having a full health bar and a good chunk of armor. Due to the previous issues, this doesn't feel like a challenge, just frustrating. Your enemies can still have poor aim and run around like headless chickens, but the enemy is still coming out of the clown cars. So you do the Call of Duty peek and shoot and occasionally someone chunks you. John Woo fighting was viable before, but here it's guaranteed death. It's telling you can change your difficulty from the death menu, but normal is an absolute cakewalk. 
On the bright side, it doesn't mean the game is over faster, so trick or treat. I'm sorry, everyone. We need to get through this to be worthy. So the combat is kind of weak. Got it. Well, how about the horror element? Well, for the most part, I've gone over it already. There are some new horror enemies, like the experimental splicers. If you've played other first-person shooters, you've likely fought something like this before. The real standout are these new mutant enemies called the Remnant. You encounter them doing something idle they did in their past life, and then they scream and start raising the dead. The best part is the animation and how they control their thralls. They don't just get back up and fight, they're being puppeteered. It's a really interesting and creepy visual. They have a lot of potential for interesting fights, which makes it all the more a shame that there's only three in the game. Yeah, that's it. You could do a lot with a corpse puppeteer. I'm floored that these guys are so underused. As for the horror sequences, you already know how I feel about the visuals. But there is one level that most people praise even if they hate Fear 2. Wade Elementary, also known as the Akira School for Clearly Psychic Children. A haunted school is an ideal setting for some spooks. The school has two issues that ruin the build-up. The first and more obvious one is that you're there with another character. What's going on here? Bluebirds, ladybugs, maybe reading levels or something. Oh shit. Armacam. We're on the right track. Tom's crapping out. Never mind, I'm good. Now the second one requires some context. Fear 2 has an absolute ton of background jokes. Some are dated, some are references, and some are downright surreal. These are nearly everywhere and the school is no exception. The shelves are lined with jokes and references. Some of you are likely thinking that's unfair. I shouldn't be staring at this stuff, I should be playing the game. Here's the thing, the videos and audio logs from Fear 1 are gone. Instead, Fear 2 has you read. But we have more detailed levels so we can have some environmental storytelling. So the school has a whole bushel of these explaining what's going on. We also have nature's petting zoo, nightmare drawings, sandwich time. One class has all the students on the board. It's another joke, all the kids are clearly developers. Alma, the villain we're supposed to be afraid of, is also there. This is a big board and it's not out of the way. After a surreal horror sequence, you're dropped back into the school, right next to it. I don't know what I'm supposed to make of this. I keep finding jokes in the place they're telling me to look for story. Horror comedy is a very fine line and I don't think the game is trying to do that. Were the minds of children corrupted by cruel, unspeakable experiments. Or, perhaps, their minds were broken learning writing from the nostalgia critic. Okay, that's probably coincidence. Please, please god, don't be a reference. There is a fantastic little segment in this, but the build-up is abrupt. The sequences here are more reminiscent of Fear 1, using physics and darkness. It's effective because it seems like something happening in reality, and not the Sunny D dimension. It's a superb haunted house. I suspect when most people remember the school, they're mainly remembering this section. This is at the halfway point of the game and it never escalates from here. It just goes back to how it was before. The scares will always be in your path. They're intense, but too intense with little or no buildup. You never have an option to make something weird happen that you can just walk away from. There's one potential saving grace and that's the story. Fear 1 had an interesting premise, but the characters were mainly flat and one-dimensional. The sequel has a lot it could improve on. Instead, it tells mostly the same story again, and somehow with even less interesting characters. Psychic cannibal killer Paxton Fatal- Paxton Fettel? His role has been replaced with Army Man. Honestly, if you played Fear 2 years ago, do you even remember Army Man? I had forgot about him on this replay. Instead of the Fear Team, we now have Delta Force. It's bigger than the Fear Team. It's bigger so you can see more people die in cutscenes. This leaves the characters they had left for the important parts less developed than they could be, because the characters who are going to die have to say some lines. As revealed in the beginning, the raid on the headquarters was a trick. You're part of Project Harbinger, which once again is trying to make commanders for clone soldiers. That's how you get slow-mo. When you're fully activated, you become bait for Alma. She's drawn to your presence, and now that's why you see her everywhere. You also learn about the third program for this called Paragon, which tries to mold children into commanders. In the grand scheme, this part is inconsequential. Topping the premise of find and shoot this guy shouldn't be hard. Fear 2 adds so many elements, but the story and beats are almost identical. You need to read a lot of intel to learn the deeper parts of the lore. I found a lot, but there were still things I didn't understand. Alma becomes interested in Beckett after Harbinger is complete, but even before that he's still seeing Alma. So later on I looked it up on the wiki. I learned that Michael Beckett as a child was also in Project Paragon. All his memories of the experiments and testing were just wiped. I guess Paragon's score should have been a giveaway, but you read this before you know what Project Paragon is. So that's my bad. He was experimented on and made to forget, like Point Man and Fear 1. 
that deeper lore is just more recycled elements. In fact, it only serves to make Fear 1 make less sense. Fear 1 was about a weapons and technology company that stumbled across something far, far beyond what they could imagine. They were in over their heads. Their treatment of all men or children is depicted as evil, but beyond that they're displayed more as being incompetent than evil. Alma is a reality-breaking discovery, but they killed her after a few people died from her. For Fear 1 Armacam, that was too far and time to stop. The big twist is that they consider Point Man, born out of their project, to be a success. All their work was buried and contained in a decaying vault. Now it turns out they had an evil school for kids, they grabbed tons of soldiers to experiment on, and have a secret, massive army of corporate soldiers. Armacam's soldiers were just like armed security guys before. The whole point was the company was manufacturing an army, not recruiting one. But now it turns out they're putting clones into space instead of Gundams to drop them from orbit. They've just gone crazy with how powerful this company is now. I can't see this Illuminati tier organization shutting down Alma. This is the problem in retreading a story when it comes to the lore and the world building. Then we have Alma herself. Her arc was done. Her vengeful spirit not only took out the people who hurt her, but also everyone in like a 10 mile radius. Her being Point Man's mother was underused, but it was effective for the game. Let's name off what it does. 1. It explains the player's time powers. 2. It explains why you see Alma doing dangerous things and murdering people, but never you. 3. Is that it gives all the visions a purpose. There's a message about the player in them. Finally, it adds a personal connection to the characters. It's really flimsy and weak, but it is there. Fear 2, to me, so clearly has nowhere to go. The string of visions in this game lead up to Alma had a hard life. That's not a reveal, that's the driving force of the first game. What doesn't come back is Fear the Organization. To someone who only plays 2, it's a completely meaningless acronym. Why are we still here? Why are we telling the same story, just worse? I always remember going down to see Alma in Fear 1. It's quiet, but you occasionally fight small groups of the most elite replica forces there are. You kill Paxson and they all shut down. This is only making things tenser because you're about to deal with the real threat. Then you descend down for the final confrontation. Here's how Fear 2 did it. Then she tricked you into getting into the telesthetic attunement chamber, which strengthened the link. That's why Alma's aware of you, and why you're totally food screwed unless you can destroy her. Fear 2 has an actual cutscene with diagrams to explain what the fuck is happening. In an attempt at a reboot, the game has non-stop been recycling from Fear 1. Someone has realized that they don't know what context was in Fear 1 or just Fear 2 anymore. Let's stop for a PowerPoint to be sure. Wait, do we actually tell them who Alma is? Uh, just tell the whole story again. I know she was completely unconscious and locked away deep underground in that telesthetic suppression field. So they turned off the life support and sealed up the facility. This goes on for a long time, but you get the idea. They have you read it, too. After this, we start copying the Quiet Descent from Fear 1, but we take a break from that. Yeah, what is there to say? This game was made in the dark age of we want the Call of Duty audience, and it really shows. Immediately after this, we bring this image back. It is convenient that Fear 2 has an image of a large ball being dropped. Then we're at the end, and the only significant moment that could be considered a spoiler because it's something truly different than Fear 1. It's also the only thing people really bring up about Fear 2 because what else is there to talk about? I'd put a spoiler time code, but it's not worth the effort anymore. Anyways, the chair was a trick and Alma sends your brain to the Sunny D dimension while she rapes your body. You kill the squad mate she's been mentally manipulating the whole game and then she reveals she has your ghost baby. It's weird, it's shocking, and it's controversial. In other words, exactly what you need to stop your game from being completely forgotten. It's not out of nowhere, the game was setting it up. Alma is more curious about Beckett, even changing her form to appeal to him. You mainly draw this from the one scene here. The quick time events weren't the exact kind of attack you thought they were. Some people get really upset about this ending. As someone familiar with horror movies, especially bad horror sequels, it doesn't offend me in like a this is bad for women kind of way. More like they were desperately out of ideas kind of way. You can argue whether it's Alma expressing her warped desire for affection or if she wants to have a ghost apocalypse baby, but it doesn't matter. Besides this going on, we've learned nothing new about Alma. Beckett has a name, but he's even less of a character than Point Man was. Beckett is no more of a character than the syringe that gave Alma her first two kids. It could have worked if everyone in the scene was more developed. Telling the same story again just with an imminent dicking subplot doesn't make it good. This was an absolute Hail Mary, but at the time, and even today, it worked. It's impossible to talk about the game without someone bringing up the scene. People talk about all the setup for the scene and ignore everything else that didn't make sense. Was there anything else in the game that was original besides that? If there was, I didn't notice it. You could just play Fear 1 and read a Daojin right after and have a much better experience. Why turn a Valve when we can have a good fight? In a complete vacuum, the game is okay, but as a sequel, it's pretty horrific. It sometimes feels like people are playing a different version of Fear 2. 
like when I read a launch review that says, yeah, Fear 1 set milestones, and this is better in every way, but it won't have the same impact. What does that mean? I wouldn't mind all this if they at least told a different story. Fear, the organization, was a combination of the Ghostbusters and Rainbow Six. That's near unlimited potential for stories. We could fight Lovecraft monsters or vampires. Maybe a mummy has an army? How about necromancers or weird science or raising the dead to make an army? That idea was toyed with a little bit. How about an evil cult up to something? If you have to have Alma, just have Point Man come back and keep her as a psychological element. She's still haunts him, and he can put her on the box. I usually don't advocate for just throwing a game's entire story away, but we could have had Nocturne's Spook House. Instead of what could have been a really compelling anthology series, we just have Alma and clones, again and again. Well, the one guy to show go to shirt, that was interesting. It is worth mentioning the DLC is solid. It has the best level design in the game, and has some interesting visuals. The downside is you can easily beat it in a half hour. Also, the DLC alone is $55 on Steam. Huh? In my Fear 1 video, I said it's really cheap on Steam sometimes. That doesn't happen anymore. You can't buy the DLC without buying every Fear game. You can't buy Fear 1 without buying every Fear game. But you can still buy 2 and 3 standalone just fine. I'm not going to get into Fear 3. I'll say that some consider Fear 2's ending a mild molesting compared to what would come after. You can still buy Fear 1 Complete on GOG. They even have Fear 2 with the DLC is the same price as the standalone on Steam. But still, why is it like this? Why is the Steam page lashing the first game to the other two? It's ridiculous. Obviously, I can't recommend Fear 2. Other military shooters from then were better, other horror games were better, and frankly, Fear 1 was better. What it does have to offer over the first game is honestly not worth the time. You made it to the end of the video, so you're worthy now. We endured that together, and next time we'll look at a much better FPS game. Halloween is soon. As it turns out, I dislike that game a lot more than I remember. Time for questions. Ever get into Rainbow Six 3 or SWAT 3 and 4? Yeah, SWAT 4 especially. There will inevitably be a video on the Elite Force mod. Will you make a video about Marble Nest or the other two Pathologic 2 characters? Marble Nest, I'm gonna say no. As for the characters, that'll depend on how different they really are. It already felt like I was half remaking my Pathologic 1 video for 2 and I didn't like that. So we'll see. What game do you think does slow motion the best? I mean, you might know now, but Max Payne is a runner-up. Then you have the games that stop time, and that's a different story. Will you review a game where the developers were openly hostile towards the fanbase, like Thief or DMC? It would probably be Thief 4, actually. I haven't played it yet because, well, we all saw how it turned out. I do want to do videos on the original Thief games eventually, and also the Dark mod, so I might be obligated to also do that one. Alright then, have a great October. Boom. Oh, 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 oh.